Welcome to the third season of Between the Lines, the podcast that brings you interviews with some lesser-known Canadian authors and writers. In this season, we will be exploring some of the works of these unknown but talented poets from various locations across this great country. From the breathtaking landscapes of the far north to the bustling downtown city streets, these writers have captured the essence of Canada in their words. In each episode, we will delve into the lives and careers of these fascinating individuals, learning about their inspirations, challenges, and their triumphs. So join us as we discover the hidden gems of Canadian literature and uncover the stories between the lines. Hello and welcome to Between the Lines. On today's show... I will be speaking with Terry Lynn Johnson, author of Sprigs and Twigs, a solitary note and selected poems collector's edition. Hello, Terry Lynn, and welcome to Between the Lines. Hello, Randy. Thank you for having me. Uh, So far, it's been my pleasure. Uh, Before we get into the nitty gritty of the interview, I wonder if you'd uh, mind giving the listeners a brief glimpse into who Terry Lynn is and what she's all about. Basically what I'm about, I'm about poetry. I've always had a passion for poetry, but what I'm about, that's kind of like a hard question for me. I would think uh, the first thing that came to my mind is when you said that or asked that was uh, John Lennon, we all want to change the world. Mm -hmm. Like I'm about changing and doing the best in my corner of the world to bring about positive change. Um, I am uh, was born in Nipigon, Ontario, the northernmost uh, point of Lake Superior. And I uh, enjoy things like walking my dog and visiting my grandchildren. I teach in First Nation education, and I'm also a survivor of mental health. Okay. That basically it? Um, well, what else could I say? Well, it's okay if it is. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I like hiking, photography. Uh, I'm always uh, looking for ways to grow spiritually, philosophically. I'm interested in current events and history. And, uh, yeah, always looking for new opportunities. I haven't traveled a lot in my life. I have uh, haven't done a lot of international travel. So I'm looking forward to that <laughs> at some mm-hmm. point. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people that are in that same boat. It's just tougher to get anywhere these days. Well, thanks for that brief um, biography. At this juncture, I would normally jump right into uh, what I call question period. But because this season I'm focusing specifically on Canadian poets and their poetry, and so you qualify as a Canadian poet, And with that being said, and since we've gotten to know you a little bit more, now would we be able to hear one of your poems? Okay, I would be happy to share a solitary note. Um, This is the frontispiece for my book, Sprigs and Twigs, a Solitary Note and Selected Poems. Mm -hmm. So um, this poem is like about a sparrow. Um, it's my bird poem. I've written several poems about birds, but this is um, the friendest piece for the book. So a solitary note. On a frosted wooded break of day, the white birches and gray poplars stand barren against November grays. The sprigs and twigs of branches hedged with the evenings for snow arch over the wooded heavens. Along the pond stilled edge, Wedges of golden grass crop through winter drifts where leaning each post run aside frozen fields. The barbed fencing enclosing the broken sod. All is still and bleak and chilled. When the torn little sparrow, perched on the lone branch of the barren birch, rustles his soft brown down for warmth and heard as a melodious solitary note, a lone little chirp, his hope to meet his mate after wintering the worst to scale with in harmony. I see the connection to the title of the book. (laughs) (laughs) 
the cover uh, of the book. The cover of the book. That's wonderful. <laughs> Did you base the poem off the cover or the cover off the poem? Well, what happened with the cover is um, I wanted like something that was minimalist. Like that's when I published my book actually was with Decluttering. So I wanted something that people would be happy to leave on a coffee table or end table. So I picked a little sparrow icon for the cover of the book, like a little stock figure. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so it's kind of like what I have on the front of my book for sure. I always like to uh, hear what inspires people's and ideas for their book covers. Um, it's, it's interesting where some of the inspiration comes from. Let's get right into question period now. Um, what is romantic poetry? Why do you describe yourself as a contemporary romantic poet? Um, well, the great romantics, I think uh, most of our listeners would be aware that the great romantics were in the late 18th, 19th century. And uh, they were actually reacting against the Industrial Revolution I think the most, the most one, the biggest one that would pop in my head is uh, Blake's The Chimney Sweeper, you know, in Songs of Innocence and Experience. Mm -hmm. So um, they were, the romantic poets were writing, um, they were using intuition rather than deduction, like imagination over reason. And they were writing about outcasts and using their imagination, uh, writing about spirituality and nature. So, um, and appealing to humanity's finer senses, the romantic poets. So, for describing myself as a contemporary romantic po poet, I like the idea of contemporary because contemporary means belonging. And uh, with the contemporary romantic poetry, my poetry has themes of spiritualism, nature, hope, and death which are common with romantics. And I write a lot about nature and spirituality. So I feel like I was on a cusp of a wave because I started writing when I was 12. And now there's a lot of contemporary poets that are writing in the same stream as me, like writing about nature and spirituality. So I feel like um, it's like I'm right out there. I've been finding a lot of poets that are, I imagine there's a whole school of us that are writing the same. <laughs> well, if, if you're, if, if a poet's not writing about nature or spirituality, what else is there to write about? <laughs> <laughs> Disillusionment. Leonard Cohen is one of my favorite poets, honestly. I, I, <laughs> Mind I you, there is a lot of faith that like he took, you know, you do see the allusion to Christianity and Judaism and stuff in his poetry also. Oh yes, absolutely. So, uh, I was just teasing. There's so yeah. much to write about. The broken are the hot, uh, what is it? The broken are the holy hallelujah. Mm. <laughs> We've all been there, right? Yep. Um, I used to be, I used to boast about being able to write about anything at any time. And a lot of the people that I worked with or had as friends would often challenge me, really write something about that tree or write something about that, that body of water or this or that. And, you know, sometimes I regretted being able to do that. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, it happened on many occasions. Um, who are your favorite poets and what appeals to you about their poetry? I think that um, Leonard Cohen and Maya Angelou are the two that come to mind. And they're the ones that I mentioned in, you know, the cover of my biography. Um, I like Maya Angelou because she's honest and direct and she like she's just total inspiration with her advocacy. Where Leonard Cohen, I like his sardonic humor, like, you know, you're kind of depressed when you're reading him, but you're still kind of laughing at him. So I would say that those are bo both my favorite poets for the time and place. Mm -hmm. That might change tomorrow. Or I might have had a different <laughs> favorite poet a few years ago. But the thing being with uh, poetry is that you're always looking for that poet, right? You're always finding a new poem, and then you look into that poet when you find the poem. And you're looking at revisiting poets that you read before or 
somebody else is telling you about a poet. So it's really the time and place and what you're going through yourself that will affect what you're thinking. And when I think of Maya Angelou, I think of, um, I know why a cage bird sings. And that is, um, poem is kind of special to me. Well, because when I was teaching grade 11 English, I tied that into Shawshank Redemption. And I taught them, um, I know why a cage bird sings. And I was told that the kids didn't like poetry, like the students did not like poetry. And I taught them that poem and I read them that poem and they're like, they were, their mouth was agape and they said, can you read that to me again? <laughs> you know, like they, they, they loved poetry when they heard that poem. So yeah, I think that there's a poem that can touch everyone and, um, you know, make sense to them out there. I was just saying that I wish that, you know, there was uh, more good English teachers, maybe <laughs> get these kids loving poetry. Well, I tell you, it was grade five, Mr. Lauren, St. George's Elementary School in Ottawa, and he hauled the class down to the library, and we were introduced to the librarian reading uh, Robert Service, The Cremation of Sam McGee. Oh, yes. That was my introduction to hearing or reading poetry. It was, it would, later on it was Robert Frost and, and, you know, the whole school curriculum of poems. But it wasn't until grade nine where my English teacher um, stood before the class and said, all right, this week we are going to learn how to write a poem. And, of course, we heard the collective, ah, and, <laughs> but, you know, it was part of our assignment, so I had to go home and do it. And I found it rather easy to do, and we were only supposed to write one poem. But I ended up writing three and not knowing which one to hand in. I handed in all three. And uh, he graded all the all the poetry all the, that everybody handed in. And he took me aside after class and goes, did you really write these? I went, yeah. He says, well, they're quite good. And, and he encouraged me to one day be published. It took 40 years, but I ended up there. But <laughs> life got in the way. <laughs> But, yeah, teachers, absolutely. Uh, if you're a teacher and you're listening to this, teach your students poetry. Yes. Even if uh, you're a history teacher. <laughs> more so if you're a history teacher because, you know, you're, the things that aren't said in the history books are in the poetry and the literature. Of the time, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I can care. Um, what is involved with your writing? With your writing process, sorry. Yeah. Usually, you know, there was uh, times where I didn't write, like, you know, a big hiatus in my life where I wasn't writing or I wasn't profusely writing. But I think that, um, like, every poet needs an audience. I think that's a big thing. So um, if you don't have that audience, you're not as willing to put yourself out there and write for some reason. So what happened with me was I... um you know, it was just when I did write, I was just putting my poems in a bucket. And I found that I've been writing more since my publication. Like I've written 43 new poems since my publication because mm -hmm. I have an audience now, right? Yeah. So what happens to me is I kind of feel like a yearning or a tugging, like almost a melancholy that I need to write. And so I guess it's a bit cathartic for me to write. And um, then from there, like the inspiration could be anything. It could be somebody else's poem that I like, or it could be somebody else's poem I don't like, and I'm going to say my own thing about it, maybe. It's, uh, you know, something I'd see a moment out in the, when on, on a walk, it could be just a moment, like a bird in a berry tree or something. Or and, a bird uh, on a wire. Yeah, a bird on a wire. Exactly. I think I got a uh, poem that's a little bit... Uh, it's called a bird atop the wire. <laughs> well, I was just referring. Uh, Leonard yeah, Cohen. I know what you. Uh, who is that? Cohen. I was. I was just listening to Leonard Cohen before while I was mm -hmm. waiting for you to come on. So <laughs> that's yeah. fresh in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to change my title a bit so that I wasn't like pl plagiarizing, right? Well, titles I don't think really matter all that much. But it's the content. <laughs> And I got, yeah, so that's what I do. I'll, I'll bounce off of something. A lot of times I'll start 
uh, you know, to just fall out of me, like uh, burnt orange tiger lilies that I wrote in 96 for my mother. But my mother passed when I was young. That one just fell out of me. And it's been critiqued as, you know, it's received a lot of high praise where some will take him four or five days to tweak before I'm happy with them. And some I'm never happy with them. Talking about Cohen, he said, you know, like sometimes you have to let it go, right? Like let the poem go if you're not getting it to be where you want it to be. But I have one poem that I've been working on since I was 17. I don't know if I'll ever let it go, but I can't get it there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we we'll see what happens. It's called The Bookshop. And then I wrote one called The Bookshop Revisited, but I can't get that poem where I want it to be. I, I can relate to that 100%. <laughs> Uh, if I go back into my file folders on my computer, I have uh, a folder called unfinished and there's over a hundred poems in there that are unfinished. Yeah. So if I finish them all, I've got another book. <laughs> yeah. And my husband always encourages me to publish those ones. Cause he says, you know, those might be the ones that people like, but if I'm not happy with it, it's yeah. <laughs> well, there's that too, right? What we're, what we're not happy with other people might be. Yeah. Yeah. You, you just know. don't know. Exactly. Um, can you share another poem with us? Um, sure can. I can share. Since I was speaking about burnt orange tag of lilies, I'll share that one with you. Wonderful. Um, this one was written, actually, this is an interesting one in the sense that um, I went through a severe depression and into my recovery, I um, was writing a journal. So this one was from that journal. And it... Um, and like my mother was very ill with Lou Gehrig's when I was young. Burnt orange tiger lilies. In front of my childhood home, the sun warmly caressed the tiger lily bedding on the barren lawn. In front of my childhood home, pumpkin pie in the oven, the burnt orange tiger lilies raged out in the autumn. In front of my childhood home, I met with my mother among pastoral lilies and forgave her for dying. Wow. So, yeah, emotional. <laughs> <laughs> I did not nobody's it's expecting that punch at the end, but I love the shift of color in the poem also, right? And for people, like, for, on a personal note that I'll share, it's the pumpkin pie in the oven is my grandmother. Oh. Because when my, when we were, my mother was there, we lived with my grandparents. So it's kind of a intergenerational poem so those that are close to you and know you would know that reference maybe okay <laughs> if i told them you <laughs> sneaky poet you <laughs> we are aren't we <laughs> yeah that's a nice tip for people to know that that pumpkin pie in the oven is actually my grandmother and if anybody's listening to this podcast and pick up your book and start reading along with it they'll have a better insight as to what you're talking about yeah or what you're feeling wonderful thanks for sharing that um do you feel that poets need to be disciplined in their craft i would say that in some ways yes in the you know not necessarily a formative education but i think that you need to be reading you need to be reading the novelists uh current events, blogs, philosophies, theologies, other poets. You just need to be reading a lot. You could be reading the great poets, the contemporary poets. You, could, you want to know what other people are doing. And But I think where the formative education comes in, I have an honors in English from Lakewood University myself. And I think the formative education comes in with knowing how to critique that poetry. No, not a critique. It find the illusions, the symbolism. You know, like Yeats. I don't think I would be able to pick up Yeats and understand them if I did not take modern poetry in university. <laughs> uh, uh, I think that's harder than mathematics. <laughs> <laughs> not I think it was that that guy on Spider-Man, Octopus, or whatever his name was, that octopus guy. Doc Ock. He, yeah, he said that that's harder than mathematics, Yeats. Some yeah. math was never quantum theory. <laughs> <laughs> um, as far as discipline, so 
um, what sort of discipline are, are you referring to? Like just learning your grammar, learning your spelling, learning your words or structure or format or? No, you know how when you learn, you're learning the symbolism and the, you know, the, um, you know, the tools that we use to write, right? Um, okay. And just learning, like, critical thinking about the poetry. Like, I I don't know if you're aware that I'm internationally published as an essayist on the Thomas Hardy Society. No. For, uh, yeah, for a critique that I did on one of his poems. I, um, in a couple of the journals there, too, like, I'm an essayist also. Nice. For critique and poetry. Um, so if you want to get that deep into what the poet is saying, you it's good to have that education for that. But it might, it might wreck it for you too, because then you just don't take it at face value, right? Like what is this guy saying really? But um But unless I think that it's kind of important. I know that at one point when I was uh in education or in like my honors, I did the masters in education after, was that uh I found that um I was thinking, oh, gee, they're, they're reckoning it for me. But, yeah, like literary theory is a good thing to have. But would you agree with this, though? Unless the author or poet tells you what that means, you're just going off your own interpretation. Or what somebody else interprets. But, you know, it's kind of like Carl Jung, I think it was, that talked about those, you know, archetypal symbols and those symbols that, you know, have a universal understanding. Like people have a universal understanding of different different symbols and stuff. Right. But you go like, through- you know, like the white lily and, you know, Keats, Keats's poem, for example, you know, like we know. You know, it's good to have maybe an understanding of some of the symbolism that's in the poetry. And it's I find it interesting how poetry will pull out something that you you might not even had a full intention yourself when you're writing it, but you do understand the symbolism behind it. But I've written things that have nothing to do with my life. I have no experience with. I've just written because I've written. And everybody reads it, and they go, oh, I'm, I feel so sorry for you. And it's not about me. <laughs> so I know. They do like to make it about you. <laughs> well, exactly, right? So it's like walking into an art gallery, looking at a painting, and going, oh, that means this. And then somebody will come up beside you and say, no, it means this. Everybody gets something different. And if that international symbolism is there, they should be agreeing, but they don't. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the thing, too, is like, for me personally, I kind of believe in that. I think it was Matthew Arnold or, you know, that idea that every art piece of art is an extension of the last piece, that kind of idea. Like, it's, you know, it's a something universal, like it's bigger than us when you're tapping into art, whether it's poetry or visual art or, you know, music. It's, we're, we're just like. Sometimes I'll put my pen to paper and it totally shocked me what comes out because like uh, solitary note is a good example. Like I do that all the time. <laughs> how did I write that? Is that me? No, it can't be me. <laughs> it's like bigger than me, right? <laughs> <laughs> I did that this morning and you know, before my first cup of coffee and I went, What? Yeah, I had a yeah. I had a concept and you know, two lines and then, you know, five stanzas later is like where, where did this come from? Yeah, like it's almost like a stream of consciousness or, you know, and what I'm not sure what people would endorse out there, but I feel like it's, you know, most poets feel the other type of, you're tapping into a medium, right? Yeah, okay. Of some type, something but a little bit bigger than you. Earlier, earlier you said that the poem just fell out of you. Sometimes they do. Okay. The best do. <laughs> I, um... Sometimes I've been known to say that I just pluck the idea from the air because yeah. they're floating out there. I think they're floating out there for anybody to grab, grab a hold of. And, you know, whatever comes by, oof, I'll take that one and I'll work on it and let yeah. others go. That's, That's interesting. <laughs> like the cloud in the sky. Hey, you never know, right? <laughs> I love cloud watching. <laughs> um, 
but that's another story in a, a few anyway. <laughs> what what are the benefits and challenges with self publication of poetry? Okay, well, the benefit, the obvious benefit is you have control over your book. You have control over your product. Like, it was nothing like, but high end for me, right? You know, that nice bond paper. The book is absolutely beautiful in its presentation. And um, so that would be the big benefit is you're getting the package that you want for your poetry. Like, I, you know, it's not a newsprint or something. Lining the bottom of the birdcage. <laughs> Where some of my poetry should be, but anyway. <laughs> so that to me is a big benefit. Um, I'm just thinking here that, um, so the presentation on content, um, there, it's a huge effort. I don't know if you're self published yourself, but I find it a huge effort to find a publisher that's willing to publish poetry when you're relatively unknown and uh, find an, an agent. So I'm looking into that right now, like maybe over the summer holidays, I'll be able to figure that out. I've got um, some of my poetry into a contest right now that I'm it's quite prestigious that I'm hoping I win. It's an anonymous contest, probably giving it away by saying that. But uh, if I win, I get some credentials on behind my name. It might help with finding a publisher. So um, you always hear about this phone call, right? You, they're going to be looking at your phone, your poetry. They're going to be phoning you for publication, but I don't think it's that easy. Um, I'm not really one for getting a rejection, so I haven't put it really out there. Are you afraid um, of rejection? It hurts if you reject it. Like if I put my poetry in a poetry competition, I don't make the long list, never mind the short list. It's, it hurts. <laughs> like, you know, you want to be um, recognized for your art for sure. I see, I, I see on the, the Facebook groups that I'm on, uh, when people get their, those rejection letters and they're like, oh, another rejection letter and they're so upset and, and, you know, heartbroken almost, it seems, that they got a rejection letter. But, I mean, the thing we've got to realize is that that piece that you've written might not fit for that particular contest or magazine or whatever. doesn't mean that it's not good and it's not an attack against you. It's yeah. just that person who read that may have had a bad day and said, ah, this is no good. For no That's other reason. It's not their style. <laughs> right? So it's got nothing sometimes, yeah. sometimes, because, I mean, there is, if you read any of mine, there's a lot of <laughs> not really good stuff out there. But, um, yeah, it's it's got, it really has nothing to do with the quality or the person who wrote it. It's just that it wasn't a fit for what they're looking for or or somebody was having a bad day. It's not necessarily because it was bad. Yeah, and I haven't even, like, I haven't put myself out there, to be honest. Okay. I've entered, before the one that I presently entered, I've entered two contests. Or maybe three. Like, maybe I entered a Remembrance Day poem when I was, like, 14 or something. To Who hasn't? <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, like, yeah, I'm not one to, um, I wasn't really one to push my poetry, um, after university, like I was always publishing in the university paper, like the Argus, but. Uh, well, that brings yeah. up another question, though. Um, I like, I mean, I had like I was publishing on some websites or whatever, right? But not. Yeah. Were you the type of person that when you were com when you completed a poem that you would go and share it with everybody or did you just keep it to yourself? You should ask my professors that one. <laughs> <laughs> I would, but they're not right here with me. And they were so busy, and it's like, oh, here she's coming, running down the hallway, waving a paper. So you're a sharer. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. But on the self-publication uh, thing, now, when you say self-publishing, do you mean through a vanity press, or, you know, you got to pay to have it published, or or are you doing it all yourself? No, I went through Freezen Press. 
okay. freezing press, and I was really, really happy with them. They, um, you know, there's some hidden costs. Like if you want your, my book is with chapters or indigo, I guess they call themselves now. And, uh, you know, you have to pay book insurance to have it on the shelf in the bigger vendors. But, uh, yeah, like the marketing is just like a traditional publisher. The marketing is up to me. So well, I've been Freeson doing Press, that through social media. Freeson Press is um, – my very first book was through Freeson Press. And it's print on demand. Yeah, yeah, it is. So uh, unless you buy your book, and bring it to a store to put get them to put it on their shelves. Freeson Press doesn't do that. But I've been like, I've been very very fortunate. My book, like, it took off. It took off like crazy. Three weeks into after print, the date of print, because I I held print. I was actually supposed to be printed on October twenty first. I got my copy. What they what do they call that copy? Proof. Proof copy. And I found an error, so I held press. So it came out on in January. And when three weeks I landed as number 10 for bestseller on Amazon, they said I wouldn't land in Indigo because I was self-published. In six weeks, I was on the shelf in Indigo. And that's not only Thunder Bay. I mean, like uh, other stores, like um, I think it's Lethbridge or Lloyd Minister, very like you know, I was driving it down into uh, Burlington, and I found my book in Coles and so look So I've been really, really fortunate with how fast my book landed. And then the yeah, so but I did the marketing. I started the marketing about ten books, ten months before the book came out. Yeah. And with my package with Freezing Press, I uh, had a marketing package. With that Dave Chilton guy, that self-made uh, millionaire or multi-millionaire guy. Yeah. So, um, I mean, if you pay into it, they're willing to do that extra stuff for you. No, I did it. But, like, I just studied the marketing. And one of the things that he recommended that I would recommend to poets is you have a handle. So, like, nobody needs to remember Terry Lynn Johnson. My handle is Lakehead Poet. Okay, so you have that handle. And also the cover, the, the title of your book has to be like, they recommend maybe two words, like something that people can remember. So sprigs and twigs, they can remember that. And that's from a solitary note, right? Sprigs and twigs, the branches hedged with the evenings for snow. Mm-hmm. So you, things that are catchy, because they're not going to go to the bookstore and say, oh, do you have Terry Lynn Johnson, sprigs and twigs, a solitary note, and selected poems, <laughs> right? Yeah. But are they not going to, they're going to Google Terry Lynn Johnson on web. Actually, there is another Terry Lynn Johnson in my area that's writing children's fiction. Okay. But if they Google Lake It Poet, that's my handle. You'll find pages and pages and pages of Lake It Poet because that's my handle for social media. Right. Yeah. Would you, would you eventually like to have a collection of your poetry traditionally published? Why or why not? Definitely. I want, and you know what, with social media, maybe you don't need it, but I definitely want my poetry traditionally published. And the reason for that is because I want to be able to enter, you know, the prestigious prestigious literary prizes like um, Griffin Poetry Award, a competition, things oh, like that, where award. you need to be recommended by the traditional publisher to even enter the contest. So unless that changes where they start recognizing self-publication, which they might, because a lot of us are self-publishing, I would like to, um, yeah, definitely have a traditional publisher so that I can, you know, perhaps win something like that. That would be like such a bonus to, you know, win a literary award for my So what I just learned about you is that you're out for the fame. No, I'm teasing. Um, not so much the fame, but like seriously, I would like to be able to make ends meet, even if it was, you know, the uh, the thing with the poetry, it, it's the posterity of the poetry, not the poet. A lot of people think the po- poet wants the posterity. You're not really concerned about yourself as much as your work. You want your work to survive, Right. Well, it will, whether you're alive or dead. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, I don't want it sitting on some shelf and, you know, it's not, uh, 
pe there for people to look back on. But the thing with the uh, awards is I would like to be a professional writer. That's all I want to be doing is writing, 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 writing. Like I've got a novel on the shelf. I want be, to be writing mm -hmm. and I'm not going to be teaching full time and writing and marketing and publishing. <laughs> you know what I say? Like it'd be nice even if it's just enough to make ends meet. It doesn't have to be millions. Part of the reason I could, why I'd say, okay, this is what I do for a living. I'm a professional writer. <laughs> part of the reason why I do this podcast is because, and I'm probably going to get into a little bit of trouble for saying this, the way that I'm going to say it, it but uh, here are my heart behind this, is um, traditional publishers, the big five, let's say, are, are, you need to read this, you need to read this, you need to read this. Well, I've read some of this and I've read some of that, and it's not nearly as good as some of the people who aren't being published by these traditional publishing houses. You know what I mean? Yeah. So um, this podcast is to give those people who are being overlooked or or not even being noticed by these uh, the the big five or any of the you know larger publishing houses to give them a, an opportunity to be heard and to hey oh this person that that was an interesting interview I'm going to go look them up that you they'll never get because traditional publishers won't even look at us. And you know the thing with that with all of that is that um like that's where self publication is really a you know a good market is because when times are changing the way they are, I mean it needs to be out there what people are saying needs to be out there, oh, and it absolutely. needs to be on the shelf and it needs to be accessible even if it's just a Kindle book or something that you download, yeah because mm -hmm. yeah, like if you got a big corporation looking after all of it, and that's the only route. I mean, what are we walking into, right? Yeah. So uh, it is important, too. The self-marketing is very, very important. Like for myself, I probably wouldn't have been out there if I didn't. And my goal with self-marketing or with self-publishing, to be honest, was um, because, you know, my kids grew up with me, right? So I'm writing so. another poem. And, yeah, well, <laughs> that's another story in itself. Uh-oh. <laughs> Can of worms, here because we go. There was shared custody with my husband, my okay. ex-husband. But, um, you know, like my daughter would roll her eyes, oh, another poem, right? You know, his mom with another poem. And um, so with the pandemic in the 20s, when I was started decluttering my house, like most of us did, and you're like reevaluating everything, <laughs> I was just throwing my poetry in a bucket oh. with no intention of even worrying about self-publication, to be honest, because... I kind of met grief with that in the 90s, and I thought, you know, it's not the avenue I want to go. I want to be writing to write. And then I started looking, and I thought, oh, this is really good stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this needs to be published. And uh, I thought, mm -hmm. I want to publish it for my children and for my grandchildren, so like kind of like a heirloom. And the money that I spent on the SAP publication would be like a drop in the bucket in their inheritance, for example. Like, what are they going to do with that? And the book is much more important, absolutely, than, than the money that I would that I spent on getting this book published. So that was part of my reasoning. And but then it took off so fast, and I and like generated so much interest that I thought, hey, you know, I would like to publish my second book now. <laughs> so now I'm back to where I started from. I got all this poetry that I didn't that needs to be published. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, I'll see. There you go. I, I have two philosophies when it comes to my writing. Um, I don't, I do not necessarily write because I have something to say, but rather because you may have something you need to hear. And the other one is I do not write for profit. I profit from writing. Oh, that's a nice one. Profit from writing. So, and uh, I think that when I'm writing, actually, if it's, um, a lot of times it's something that I'm sorting through, whether it's spiritually or whether it's emotional or like, you know, I write from a place usually a bittersweet melancholy. <laughs> <laughs> I can relate to that. <laughs> so it's a no, lot I don't of times it's, it. I'm writing for me. And then, the, I mean, the poems are beautiful. They um, we speak to um, 
people like that's the feedback that I get is that people love my poetry that they can understand my poetry and uh, they, a lot of them will say oh, I didn't even know I love poetry until I started reading yours right yeah so a lot of you, you hear that a lot oh I don't read poetry or I don't like poetry I know and <laughs> another question that I ask sometimes or usually bring up in discussion is uh, poetry today is not as popular as it was, like, say, during the Renaissance, right, where it was at its peak. And it, it comes in cycles and comes in cycles. And I think we are just coming out of a very low part of the cycle with poetry and that it is it is starting to experience a resurgence. Would you agree yeah. with that? It definitely is a resurgence. And then when you look at the Instagram poets and such, though, because, um, well, like, we can get out there with social media, right? Which is our next question, so yeah, <laughs> might as well just ask it right now, and we'll move right into that. So poetry has a small market um, of readers. Does I'm having a problem reading this. Does social media uh, benefit poets as to reaching a larger market? And I'm saying that questionably because I think maybe um, a different word could be used there, but. Um, what are the pros and cons of poetry being published on social media in your view? Um, I think a pro, like the, there's a lot of pros to social media, right? That's how got, that got me out there for social media. Because mm-hmm. like I mentioned, I started with my handle a good 10 months before the publication of my book. So I published like a post for the day, a a uh, poem quote, uh, you know, mm-hmm. a poem. It got me out there so that I had a, you know, the audience was ready for my book, or at least I like to think so. Mind you, I don't have that big of an audience. But I think that um, you look at somebody like some of the popular Instagram poets, like Rupi Carr, for example. Is that how you say it? Rupi Carr? I don't know. I don't use um, Anyway, like she's making, she's doing world tours with her poetry, right? And she promoted herself on Instagram, and she um, then, like, you know, was a bestseller with her book, first book of poetry. So, you know, it gets, you can get out there. But then when Jimmy Fallon was interviewing her, you know, he said poetry is pop. Like, he's talking about the resurgence of poetry, right? Poetry is pop. And I'm thinking, do we want poetry to be pop? Because is it just going to be absorbed as a counterculture, you know, into the mainstream? Well, that's how media would put it or want to. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, you know, a lot of the poetry is what I would call epigrams or platitudes or mm-hmm. euphemisms, is, you know, euphemisms. Euphemisms. Euphem- euphem- Say euphemism. Say that again. Euphemism. <laughs> I'll leave it with you. Okay, but you know okay. what I'm saying? That the, I do. And yeah, like, so is it, and then, you know, and what's happening to our society that that's, is that, if that's where poetry is going, right? That That's a big question for me because if it's like a bite size, like B-Y-T-E, size of poetry, and it's like going past you on Instagram or Twitter or TikTok or whatever, like, is that where we want the art of poetry going? Well, I don't see the Egyptians doing hieroglyphics of poetry. Because <laughs> that's the way the language is going. We're going back to hieroglyphics. If yeah. They had it their way. So, um, it has its pros and cons. I uh, actually um, had a series of videos done with my poetry with local um, drone footage, that type of thing. Okay. Where I read, and my husband is a professional musician, so he's playing acoustic guitar in behind. Okay. And uh, that's a very beautiful presentation because altogether, I did 10 poems altogether. They take maybe a total of 10 minutes, Mm -hmm. you know, and I posted one every 20 days or so for, um, you know, social push of my poetry, like social media push. And then the whole series. So I think that's something that'll probably be up there for a while, like interest, bring interest because I mean, we're still, you know, where uh, you know, I'll be listening to Robert Frost reading his poetry or something on YouTube, right? So as long as YouTube's up, that that's a good. I think that's a good media to be running with. You know, I don't see any signs of YouTube slowing down. So 
it might be a safe place. <laughs> yeah, that might be. Um, a few years ago, many, well, eight, eight years ago maybe, I started a, uh, a YouTube channel called The Poet Apprentice. And I, w- I would make little, uh, you know, my poetry on, on slideshows with background music. Well, that sounds interesting. Uh, something sim- simple, right? But yeah. and that was before I started learning more. Uh, I may pick it up again. I do not know. Uh, if you're interested in hearing or seeing it, let me know and, and I will get back to it. Uh, yeah, I would love to uh, look into that. Um, because but, I do have like, um, you know, poems that I've considered. Like I have one called Praise I Seasons that I've been considering putting out in some form of media, right? Okay. I've got uh, a, a poem that I wrote called My Box of Boxes. You know how we put everything in boxes, but I've got a box to put all my boxes in. And <laughs> and that is actually one of the poems that made it to the Poet's Apprentice YouTube channel. Okay. But Poet's Apprentice. Yeah, that makes me think of my Christmas ornaments. <laughs> but I quit that last year. I took them all over the boxes and wrapped them in tissue paper, and I got rid of about two tubs of Christmas ornaments that way. Oh, there you go. Speaking of Christmas, <laughs> are you aware that uh, Between the Lines – um, is going to be doing another uh, two bonus Christmas episodes where uh, authors um, submit their audio recordings of their original Christmas poetry or stories or essays. I do have a couple of Christmas poems. Okay, well, <laughs> record them and send them to me, and, okay. and I'll include them in the podcast for the Christmas. I did uh, two episodes last Christmas. People just loved it. Yeah, that sounds, I've got a beautiful Christmas poem. I've actually got two, one in my book mm-hmm. and uh, like my collection, my published collection and one that I wrote for my next book. So, you know, feel free to uh, submit it. Uh, uh, we, I, we can continue through email later and talk about that. Um, so are you done with the pros and cons of either? I think that, uh, well, not everyone can afford like, you know, to go through somebody like Freezing Press. I have a cousin that's, um, I guess she's more of a novelist, but I mean, that's a real block that she's facing, right? Mm-hmm. She writes some um, Christian fiction. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess that's a pretty hard sale. And well, she, can't, she can't afford to self-publish. Well, but you, she can do it for free on Amazon. Yeah. Is that how that works? I don't even know. About I've it. got 10 books all on Amazon. And they're free publications? Yeah. Oh, wow. It costs me nothing except if I wanted to pay somebody to professionally edit it, you know, that's, you know, that's the only expenses is, is, you know, the editing or if you've got somebody that can do, you know, graphic arts for your covers at, you know, for free or cheap or whatever, whatever, that kind of money, but to do everything on, on Amazon, free. I didn't even know that, and but I do like more having of my the book. You get more I of the profit. I have to grab my book for you so you can see it. Uh, uh, yeah, I've, I've actually like got a picture them. of the cover. I'm kind of old-fashioned that way, maybe. Like, what's happening to libraries? Like, I hope they're going to stay around because oh, they, they, <laughs> I don't want they, everything electronic. The library does. will not die. Trust me. Yeah, I hope not. Um, because I worry about, like, you know, when they put things down into like electronics and, you know, you can't find it. It's a rare copy of a book or something. And I don't want it to go that way. Like I want people to be able to read, you know, something that hasn't been revised from the original publications and, you know. There are diehard readers out there where it has to be in their hand. Yeah. Lipping I love pages. curling up with a book. See, my both my axes are the same way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they'd rather curl up published with, on Amazon. They left you, right? <laughs> they'd, no, they'd rather curl up with a book than with me. But that's another story in another episode and another podcast. <laughs> so, on every guest gets a series of questions that they get to pick and want to answer themselves. But there's the mysterious eighth question that nobody knows about. So I'm going to ask you the eighth question. And here it goes. Is there a topic you consider taboo for you to write about or include in your poetry? Why or why not? A taboo topic. I, you know, incest or young love or. Oh, oh no. I, 
I've got uh, a poem in my collection about um, child abuse, like sexual child abuse. Okay. Yeah. Um, you say you've touched on mental health. So um, everybody's got something that they're not comfortable writing about. Um, I would say. I, I have it. I don't write dark. Okay. I don't know if I could. Um, or if I would, it's not really my, in my, um, but I don't think it's taboo. It's just not what I'm writing. Right. Like, <laughs> um, I mean, we need our dark poets too, right? We absolutely do. I interviewed one not too long ago. <laughs> um, I don't think that there should be anything taboo. I mean, it's, if it's something that you feel compelled to write about, then. But you, I mean, you don't want to make any biographical references or, you know, uh, something might have to sit on the shelf for a while. Like I'm my, my, uh, the book, the novel, I'm in my fourth draft of my novel and it's a biographical fiction, you know, it, um, took me some time to put that down, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It took me like the 2020 when I wasn't working. (laughs) Um, You know as well as I do that in today's society, in today's culture, anybody can be offended by anything. Yeah. So as writers, should we be careful or should we be writing our hearts? Um, If, well, you wrote, obviously if you wrote something, you're going to lose an audience no matter what you write. If I write, I mean, you're going to always offend someone. (laughs) That's exactly my point. So do you yeah, write it anyway? Yeah. So, I mean, there are things that I'll be careful with, especially if I'm not literate on it. Like, I don't want to write about something that I'm not educated on myself. Right. But that's where mm-hmm. hashtags come in. Yeah. <laughs> like, Because so, everybody follows the hashtag. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, like, so, you know, I think that people have to tell their own story, too. Like, I'm not comfortable telling somebody else's story. Mind you, I do have a poem in there for uh, First Nations also okay. in the collection. It's uh, called A Poem for the Children. Okay. And that was written when uh, I found, when the Onmark Waves first started hitting the news. Mm-hmm. And I just felt terrible about it um, because, uh, well, we, I've been working with First Nations for my education as a teacher for about 12 years. And that's why it was close to you. It was very close to my heart, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I get that. So, but I mean, I don't think I would start telling their story. That's, you know, that's um, not for me to write about. So maybe if it's not your story, I don't know. You could research it, though. But there are things that are, you know, as as poets, there are things that influence us to write for whatever reason. Yeah. Right? So uh, it is an art form. It's not a, it's not a, well, I guess some people try to be, historically accurate or whatever anyway it's uh yeah for me i um like the ukraine has definitely been pushing me to write like i a lot that's a big theme in my poetry is poetry for peace right now i've been writing a lot about and it was kind of interesting because on canada writes um you know We're going to move into uh, the next section, part two, called Shameless Plugging, which is what I really like to do with anybody that I get on the show, especially if they have a book or, or something, because really I want to I want to point our listening audience to towards our guests' um, books or works or wherever they are. So um, question number one, uh, what books do you currently have? Uh, available on the market, and where can people find them? Okay, my uh, away. first collection is Sprigs and Twigs, a Solitary Note of Selected Poems, Collector's Edition. Um, the reason I call it Collector's Edition is because I have some biographical poems in there, or like, you know, poetry that I won't be republishing or not intending to republish. So it's like, a gem from the time I was 12. I got a poem that I wrote in there that I was 12 years old at the time to the time of publication in 2021. So if you want to see the growth of a poet's mind, you might want to be looking at that book. <laughs> buy, it, um, buy it, buy it, 
Yeah, yeah, buy it. Buy it at, uh, well, if you go www.lakedpoet.com, which is my handle, you're going to find links to purchase this book. Okay. And that would be like, you know, the ebooks and also Amazon and, and, uh, chat or Indigo and, and also, if you just like Google Sprigs and Twigs poetry, you'll find a lot of um, independent vendors also. Okay. Um, so it's easy to find. Wonderful. It's easy to find. And you have another one, or? I have a collection of poetry that's not published. That, yeah, no, this is my first publication. It's oh. it's just had its anniversary. On the 21st of October, my one first publication. One year? One year, yep. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, I next, put Lodi. I, I attached Lodi. Do you know CCR? I attached Lodi to my first anniversary, and I said, happy anniversary, Sprigs and Twigs. <laughs> uh, I happen to like that song. I don't like the group, but I like the song. Well, yeah, this song has a lot of meaning for me because I tend to run around in circles. I've actually been to Lodi, so. <laughs> oh, wow. I've never been there. Are you currently working on anything? And if so, how close to completion is it? So we know that you've got something going, but how close to completion? Well, the poetry, I mean, I could send it out any time, right? I'm just waiting because some of those poems are um, in a competition that I'll hear about in the new year, whether I made the list or not. So I'm waiting for that. But I mean, they could be published any time because my first book had 55 poems. So this book is sitting at 65 right now. It's called Driftwood Tones. And it's a whole different feel. But if you, have, if you have some of these in a competition, until that's cleared from the competition. Yeah, hopefully I'll write some more while we're yeah. waiting. But if, it's, <laughs> if, if it advances or wins then you won't be able to publish it into into your book until they tell you you can. Yeah, yeah, for at least 12 months probably. Yeah. But that's fine. Yeah. But because, if, it, um, if it doesn't I mean, make it into the competition, then you're free to do it. Yeah. But, I mean, if it makes it in the competition, then I'm, you know, I'm well on my way because then I'll send accreditation, like, you know, I won this. I can say that to a traditional publisher, right? Like, pay attention to me. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I've got the poetry ready. I publish my poetry all the time anyway. Like if you go on to facebook.com and you're going to find my poems. You go under poems or piece or poems. I... Some people would question as to whether or not that's officially published because yeah. some places will not will not accept that as a publication. No, that's not published. Or no, but accept. I mean if somebody wants to read it. Oh, absolutely. That's just yeah. putting it out there, yeah. Yeah, because I know that Traditional publishers, for the most part, don't uh, think of social media as publication, so there isn't, like, a conflict there as far as, well, you got it here, like, we can't publish this poem because, well, because everything do. copyright, right? And that's why I self-publish. <laughs> yeah. Name. So I, um, yeah, I uh, will publish, most of the time I'll publish a poem because I want it to be in context, the place and time that I'm writing it, and you know, well, immediate because okay. you get immediate feedback, which is what we're after. Not really. <laughs> Two or three likes, click, click, click. Well, it's you know, I <laughs> again. With all my family and friends, seriously, I love you all, but <laughs> get your act together. No, <laughs> um, I've always said this. I don't care if you like it or hate it. I want to know why you don't like it or why you do like it. That's what's important to me. Like, yeah. like or not is an opinion. You can keep your opinions because everybody's got them. I want to know why you like it. I want to. I want to know how it makes you feel or think. And yeah, that's, that's for the, me. That's... I find that like to go like for example, if I go into Canada rights or you know go to do read a, read my poetry, you get better feedback than on social media because. Yeah, people are out there to listen to you and to talk to you. And with Canada Writes, I mean, you're you're up there, you know, you're up there with other poets or other writers that are, you know, pretty high in caliber. So yeah. I like that type of feedback from them. You know, I like getting feedback from them. By no way do we endorse or uh, 
uh, promote Canada rights. We do, yeah, I'm sorry. We do endorse <laughs> and we do promote Canadian creative writers. No, I'm kidding. That's that's my Facebook group. <laughs> We're talking Facebook, right? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's my, I have a Facebook group called Canadian Creative Writers. Okay. You should join. <laughs> I will join. <laughs> Look it up. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, you know what? It's a lot different than Canada Writes and uh, some people like it. Some people don't. Well, some people get nasty on social media too. On the, well, not in my you know, on the other side of the fence. So you really can't take any of it too personally. No, you can't because not everybody's who they say they are anyway. Yeah, um, if you had, true. if you had to choose one of your books or poems in this case as a favorite, which one would it be? Well, I read to you, um, your very first one, my solitary note, and I read Burnt Orange Tiger Lilies, which is up there with the favorite, of course, with the topic and, and the feedback that I got on it. But my most recent favorite poem would be Rustic Leaves. Okay. And that's in my uh, collection with Sprigs and Twigs. Wonderful. Um, where can, where can people connect with you? Uh, Facebook, email, snail mail, TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn. I mean, the list can go on and on and on. Yeah. So you get the idea of where I'm going with this. Where can they find you? They can find me. Um, well, the easiest way to find me is LakeHeadPoet.com because I have all the little social icons up right. It's all right one here. word or is it hyphenated? No, it's all one word, okay. LakeHeadPoet.com and uh, www.LakeHeadPoet.com. Mm-hmm. And then I'll have the little social medias because I'm on YouTube with videos, as I've mentioned, um, Instagram, Facebook. What's your Facebook. Instagram? Tag? Lakehead Poet. Okay. Everything's Lakehead Poet. Everything is? <laughs> yeah. Including yeah. Facebook? Facebook? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Like, I had a big strategy when I marketed this book. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I studied some marketing. It was like, okay, I, this can be my handle. It hurts my eyes. And you know what? I made turning points in April of uh, the April issue of Lakehead uh, University. I made turning points. Okay. And it's a magazine that they publish. It's not by no means an endorsement by Lakehead University, but it's a pretty big thing to make Absolutely. in the magazine. And they acknowledged uh, me in there. And I was pretty happy to have that little Lakehead University logo beside my name when you're I Googling bet. me. I can, well, <laughs> I can even see your smile right now. That's how yeah. big you're smiling. Yeah, it was a big day for me. Uh, any other place that you can be found, or is that pretty much it? Also, we've got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and my official website, LakeHeadPoet.com. And so, like, I, yeah, my official website has a Gmail. It's a LakeHeadPoet at gmail.com. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, can you share one or two more poems? I can share my rustic leaves that I was just talking about. I like this one because it's kind of a statement on how busy society is, (laughs) how we kind of forget about people. All right. Was he busy? Sorry? I was just saying French. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Rustic leaves. He returned to the park, the evening chilled, the bench mottled with rustic leaves, his collar buttoned with the evening breeze. He had hoped to see her again, as they had sat on the bench in early fall with the sun glimpsing through the poplar. His dog's snowing eyes held his own with a slight tail wag as he raised his weary bones after sitting some time to stride down the boardwalk. With the evening sun over the golden marshes, with red-winged blackbirds, with his dog, and with his stories untold. In my mind, I'm picturing everything. So you did well. Yeah, I'm. I'm very. Uh, I have very strong imagery in my poetry. And because of my visual imperfections, I have to, to be able to see it in my mind to get a full. So you're you're working my mind. So thank you. <laughs> so if you want me to read another poem, I'm going yeah. to have to grab my book. I'll just do. One more. One more. 
I'll just look really, really quick. It may be a different flavor. I like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> we did. I did talk about Maya Angelou. I know why Cage Bird sings. Mm -hmm. This is my response to that poem. Oh, love yeah. to hear. It's a bit different, so you might like it, like different than what I've read you. So this one is called, What If the Cage Bird Has No Song? What if the cage bird has no song, feathers of color all but gone, vision flailing against the breast, to acknowledge condition is at best, safe against the winds of rage, and white-capped waters in the bay. Rather than flight in slate gray skies, it is better to nest in cage at night. What if the cage bird has no song? What if the cage bird has no song, while the ways of this world carry on? Vigor and strength of youth fails, with hope as bird in his path for long. Ah, but the young will pick up and fly, if the world weeps and dreams pass by, from lustered pinks in the morning glow, to silhouetted jags in the evening sky. What if the cage bird has no song? What if the cage bird has no song for the moment breeze to carry on? With bright wings clipped, a single note, escaping from deep within the throat. But missed in the hustle of freedom spent and burnt off with the mist the morning dew. Is thrown a perch without a care as to rumor of freedom or hope out there. What if the cage bird has no song? Interesting. What do you think um, Maya would have thought of that? It was written while she was still alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was. I, it, would, it would be nice if she had seen it. I've seen Maya Angelou. Wouldn't it have been interesting to get a, a response from her on that? Sorry, I actually never read that poem aloud, so it wasn't going to be as smooth as it could be, but... You, you know what? You did fine. You did fine. <laughs> I understood it, and that's all that matters. And if I can understand it, most people will probably... Have this one is everyone's that uh, a lot love this one. I'll read you one more. Okay. This one is very popular with uh, anybody that people tend to like this one is what I'm trying to say. Okay. It's called Train Station Platform. Travel with the good with the beginning of a new journey and leave the old baggage that weighs you down on the platform as you board the train. Leave the old behind as you steam ahead, taking only your lessons in life. Leave the old behind as the train whistles around the bend of forgiveness. The thing about old baggage is one does not remember what was packed or why. Label fragile and let it go. Let it go and let it be as you board the train with the conductor's last call. Reminds me of a series of poems that I uh, I started writing and never finished. <laughs> Thanks. Now i got to get back to finish. Yeah, that. now i got to get back there. Well, where I live in Red Rock, I always hear the train whistling, right? Right. So do I. Around the bend, so <laughs> that's kind of what inspired that poem was the sound of that one. So I just love it. Yep, it's yeah, yeah. Whatever inspires you to write, right? So, in closing, what would you tell anyone who might be too afraid to take the chance on being published? I think that while well, they're afraid to be published, like afraid to take the chance to be published. Mm -hmm. I think I would tell them that they're not ready for publication yet to wait because I kind of went through that in the nineties, you know, like I was a little bit nervous about being published and about what I was writing. And like now I'm ready to be published. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm excited about um, being published and I'm ready to be published again. So I think that when the place and the time is right, you'll know, uh, if you're afraid to be published, maybe it's not time. It's not quite time for you to put, you know, it's your heart and your soul that you're putting out there, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you, maybe you're not quite ready for that. Makes absolute sense to me. Yeah. Um, yeah, if you're controlled by fear, though, um, you need to get over that eventually somehow. And yeah. Taking that first step or, you know, having friends and family support you in that decision or helping you with that process. Like when I had mentioned that, like I was a survivor of uh, mental health, mm -hmm. I was what, like, I went through a severe depression in my nineties. And so like some of my poetry 
I was afraid to put out there, right? Mm -hmm. And so I obviously I wasn't ready for publication, but um, I contacted CMHA and I went to read for them for, um, they presented my book. And so I'm hoping that like this gets bigger as we move along through the years. And um, I went to new foundations in Thunder Bay and I read for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a big, big step for me to say, okay, I'm a survivor of mental illness and I'm contacting CMHJ and I'm reading, uh, they're presenting my book, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. you have to be ready for those kind of things. And I had such a warm reception, like there was about 35 people that came out. It was a bannock breakfast and, and I just could feel the love. It was such a beautiful, beautiful poetry reading and everybody was warm and welcoming and loving my poetry and understanding my poetry because maybe, you know, they're understanding a little bit about what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And it was the most wonderful thing I ever did. That is awesome. <laughs> Terry Lynn, thank you for coming <laughs> on and being on, on Between the Lines. Uh, it was great to get to know you a little bit better. I mean, we've been emailing back and forth and trying to coordinate and connect and all that wonderful stuff. But um, hearing you and, and, and hearing your poetry, um, it's, it's been good for my heart, good for my soul. Thank you. Um, thank you for sharing. I'm looking forward to looking you up also. Well, thank you so much. But we'll keep in touch. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Um, with that, um, I'm going to say... Thank you once again, and talk to you later. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of Between the Lines. We hope you enjoyed our discussion and were inspired to either start writing or to keep on writing. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for future episodes or guests, you can reach out to us by sending an email to randy.b tl podcast at gmail.com use comment or suggestion in the subject line for a copy of the transcript of this or any other episode just send us an email using transcript as the subject line and indicate which season and episode you would like a transcript for Visit my website, therandylacy.ca, where you can purchase one of my books, read my blog, and yes, even hear every episode of this podcast. If you have enjoyed what you've heard and would like to hear more, click the Buy Me a Coffee button at the top right corner of the page to help cover the costs associated with keeping this show available to you. If you're ever feeling overwhelmed by the many lines in your life, take a deep breath and remember the wise words of Winnie the Pooh. Sometimes the smallest things take up the most room in your heart. Until next time, keep on keeping between the lines. <laughs>